Well, good morning again, church family. It is my joy to be with you again, breaking open the Word of God. My name is Jeff, and I'm the lead pastor here. I'm happy to be with you, and so I would encourage you right now to gather whoever is around you. If you're, if you're not just you and the Holy Spirit drinking this Word in today, would you gather your children, perhaps your parents, maybe some friends that you've invited over in your house church situation today, but however you are situated, I pray that you would eliminate distractions. My hope for you is that you would be distraction-free and you would come to the Lord with focus so that He can speak directly into your heart. In fact, that has been my prayer coming into preaching this message is, Lord, speak through me so that when they hear my voice, they're actually hearing your truth. In the name of Jesus, it remains my prayer and everyone would say, Amen in agreement. Amen. Well, we're in our series, The Good Life, and this message is called Time to Be Different. So turn in your Bibles, if you would, to 1 Corinthians 6 and John chapter 10. 1 Corinthians 6 and John chapter 10, as we say our Bible declaration today. Hold up your Bibles and let's say this together. This is my Bible. It is God speaking to me. I am who it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I can have what it says I can have. So I open my heart today to hear God speak a word that will change my life forever. Oh, church, I want to bring you something today that is so magnificent, <laughs> that is so life-giving, that your, every fiber of your being just exudes light and life after you've heard it. That's what I want for you today. And that's why I believe you come today, is to hear such a word, to hear God tell you such good things from the Bible, from His Word, that you just, you walk out on cloud nine, you're like, I'm ready to take on this world. Come on, me and the Lord, <laughs> amen. And so we can walk out with that confidence today. We can depart from this message, having given God our attention and say, together, we know what God is calling us to. And even, even beyond that, it gets better. God tells you individually what he wants from you. He is so good, so personable, so personal and individual. He will outline to you what your next steps are as well. And we'll lead you through some of that today as you hear from the Holy Spirit. But look, I got to warn you before we get into this thing that this is going to be a no holds barred presentation. All right. Uh, this is what life, what the good life looks like, but we have to contrast it with the not good life, with the bad life. All right. And uh, this is not just new life in Christ for the new believer, although this message is for you. This is not only for the believer who's been kind of just uh, in name only said the prayer, you know, I'm in. Right. Uh, this is also for the longtime believer who maybe wants a refilling to, to overflowing so that you can minister to those around you in the way that God wants for every single believer. But I have to be allowed to speak plainly to you today. So will you allow me to do it? Will you allow me to, to just speak plainly as the disciples told Jesus? Now you're not using any figures of speech. Now you're speaking to us plainly. I know no one's at home going, no, don't do it. I know you're all welcoming this. And so just in faith, I'm believing that here all alone in the worship center, looking at you. But here I'm, I'm looking I'm looking at you I, and I love you and I'm going to say this for your good. OK, so even if some of this seems hard, it's only because I love you. All right. And the Lord loves you and he wants to tell you the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Last week, we talked about Jesus words in John 10, 10. It says the thief does not come except to steal, to kill and to destroy. But I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. You see, Jesus wants us to know that we do have an enemy. Look, there's, there's so much in this little passage of scripture right here. Number one, Jesus is explaining that there is a thief. Number two, he's telling us what that thief's agenda is to steal from us, kill us, and destroy us. None of those are pleasant. And number three, he wants us to know that it's the complete opposite of his agenda that Jesus also has an agenda, but it's completely opposite from the thief's agenda. Jesus, by contrast, wants to give you the good life. He wants to build you a solid life. Sounds like a radical difference between Jesus and the thief, the enemy, the devil. It's true. Look, a lot of people won't tell you this. 
but I'm telling you this. In keeping it from you, what, what people might inadvertently do, what they might intentionally do, but I believe mostly inadvertently, is they're denying you the opportunity to emerge from ignorance. I just don't know this yet. No one's told me, right? Because people keep not telling me. Not here. I'm going to tell you exactly what Jesus wants you to hear. So you can emerge from that ignorance and you can come into knowledge. They shall know the truth and the truth shall make them free. That the enemy has some devices. The enemy has some ways that he finds you and gets to you. And man, we're all such suckers. <laughs> Humans, we just fall for it all the time. And, and he doesn't need any new tricks because the old ones work so well. And so we are not ignorant of his devices. At least we don't need to be anymore after hearing a message just like this. So stay with me. Uh, even though it's not pleasant, it is the truth. And I have been sent here to equip you to bring you the truth. The whole truth and nothing but the truth. So help me, God, to speak that whole truth and nothing but the truth. Let me lead your people into the way everlasting. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's compare these two sides. Let's compare the thief and let's compare Jesus so you can readily distinguish between the two of them. See, the most important reason that Jesus came to earth from, look, he was in heaven. What, what more could the guy want? He wants you. And the only way to get you was to leave perfection in heaven, right with, so close with the Father. In fact, please let me teach you in Operation Solid Lives Level 1 all about this, but here's just a taste. He leaves all of that in heaven. Perfection, relationship with the Father and the Holy Spirit. So close, so intimate, so perfect. And he comes down here, to this planet, to this mess? Why? Why would Jesus choose to do such a thing? It's the most important thing. He had to because we can't save ourselves from our sin. And all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, we know in Romans. Look, Jesus had to come to save us from our sin and to give us eternal life. Doesn't that sound good? And isn't that a far cry different from the thief? The thief is far cry short of Jesus. The thief is trying to rob from you and to destroy you. Jesus is coming to give you life. And our life on earth is so short. Did anyone ever see that Francis Chan thing where he, he draped this rope all back and forth and back and forth across the state? There's just mountains of rope up on the platform where he's preaching. And then he finds this one piece and he puts a little piece of red tape on it. And he says, you see this little piece of red tape? This is your life on earth. And the rest of this rope, this is your life for all of the rest of eternity. But we focus and we care and we spend so much energy on this instead of this. It shouldn't be that way. It should not be that way. We have an eternity to look forward to with God. If we play our cards right here and he's telling us how today. Eternity is so long. Let's not, let's not get that wrong. Amen. I'm going to read you another scripture. Perhaps you know it. And, and if not from the Bible, you've seen it at a football game. It's Jesus that says in uh, John 3, 16, says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I'm telling you, Jesus has life plans for you. He has good life plans, not death plans. That's the thief's job, right? Death plans. Jesus has life plans for you. And there is nothing even remotely close uh, to the importance of being saved from your sins. Nothing compares. Nothing compares to this. Born again and on your way to heaven, that is number one. If you're going to get one thing from God, get that one. Amen. You know, spirit-filled people, we're talking about the gifts and everything else, and we revel in that. But man, if you're going to get one thing from the Lord, get salvation. Amen. And this happens when a person repents of their sin. Repentance, of course, is just turning around, turning away from, turning the other direction. That's repentance. And we talk about true repentance in discipleship and Operation Solid Lives. So I'm going to keep plugging it because it starts today if you're watching this service live. So this happens when a person repents of their sin, renounces that old sinful lifestyle, and sincerely commits to make Jesus 
Lord. Can you say that word with me? Lord. Just say it out of your mouth. Lord. Can we give it one more go? Lord. We got to get used to saying that word. I want you to pick up on the significance of these precise words from God himself, who inspired the Apostle Paul, who, as you know, wrote most of the New Testament, to write these words down in what we now read as the book to the Romans. Uh, the people in Rome, called Romans, right? It's just a letter that Paul wrote because he was inspired by God to write it and give instructions to people who desperately needed these specific instructions. And may they benefit us today. In Romans 10, 9 through 10, Paul writes, and really it's the Holy Spirit who says this, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now I'm going to tell you more about that in a second, but let's look at what verse 10 says. It goes on to say this, For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. All right, so what do we need to confess to get salvation? What needs to come out of our mouths? And uh, the Bible also says that out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So what needs to be born in our heart coming out of our mouths in order for us to be saved, to get salvation, to get this rescue from this world of darkness and sin and be brought into the good life? This transformation is not, I sincerely commit to make Jesus my Savior. Let me say that again because I probably just freaked you out. This transformation is not, I commit to make Jesus my Savior. Sincerely, from the bottom of my heart, Jesus my Savior. That's not what this says. And most people live like they prefer that it say that. Most people want a Savior, not a Lord. The Scripture says you confess the Lord Jesus, not the Savior Jesus. If you confess the Lord Jesus, then you get salvation. <laughs> most people operate like this. Although they're not honest with themselves, they wouldn't really say it. But this is what we're really saying with our lives. We say, Jesus, I believe you exist. I pray you just keep me out of hell. And when it's my time to go, then uh, take me to heaven. I'll just uh, be, be over here. You, you do all the blessing stuff for me and, and I'll just keep living however the hell I want. Now that may turn you off, but I said it intentionally. Because anything that's not of faith is sin. Anything that's not of faith is sin. And so if you're not doing God stuff, you're doing devil stuff. That's bottom line. That's as easy as that. And so, Jesus, you do all the blessing. I'll just live however I want. Hellish or not. I'm just going to do what I want. Because I'll take you as Savior to save me from all the stuff that I don't want, don't like. But I'm not interested in making you Lord, like my master or the one who makes all my decisions or controls me. Uh, no, you, you don't own me. No one owns me. We got one Lord over here and it is me. That's how people who say, pray this prayer in church and everything. And then they go live like that didn't happen. And they, it's because they really don't know what this scripture means. Lordship, the Lord is giving Jesus absolute control of your whole life, of your whole eternity from now, from now on giving Jesus control. Now, I'll just take the Savior, Jesus, if you don't mind. You can keep that Lord Jesus stuff. Uh, I already got a Lord. I'm straight. I'm set. That's me. I call all my shots, right? <laughs> Last week, I did it my way. No one tells me what to do. Don't tread on me, right? Or, or uh, if you do tread on me, look, look what's going to happen from my little logo on my little flag here is uh, I'm going to bite you. And I got some venom in these fangs and I'm going to take you out. I'm going to cause you some major harm if you try to make my life go any different way than how I'm saying it's going to go. How I want it to go. How I determine I'm the master of my own destiny. Well, that doesn't sound like you've given lordship to Jesus. And that's what we all must do is give lordship to Jesus. Imagine, <laughs> not only that, but this the little rattlesnake on the flag all coiled up, right? Ready to strike. Pastor Caleb, an evangelical, freedom-loving, retired United States Army man, has asked me from time to time, picture Jesus like this. And so if you can do this exercise with me, picture Jesus with a 
Gun slung over his shoulder. A few grenades on his belt. Sidearm. Locked and loaded. Ready to go. My kids giggle and laugh when they say, can you imagine? <laughs> they just, just that simple phrase, can you imagine? Well, I'm asking you, can you imagine that? I bet you can draw this horrific caricature of Jesus in your mind, but something on the inside tells you, no, nah, it's not right. It's not right. That would never happen. Jesus would never be like that. Okay. That's probably because you read somewhere in the Bible at some point in your life, Matthew 5, 44 through 45, which say, but I say to you, love your enemies. Look, Jesus is not messing around with friends and enemies. He says, I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you. Man, doggone. What? Who, who use you out of spite? That's some hateful people. That's some hateful conduct. Nevertheless, Jesus gives us instruction, pray for those people. And he goes on to say, that you may be sons of your father in heaven. See, God's kids act a different way than the world. Jesus gives us instructions right here. How about this one? Imagine this, Jesus leading a group of people either a mob or a protest, however you like, waving a flag against a group of people, could be scheming, power-hungry religious leaders, or an oppressive government suppressing citizens' rights to freedom of religion and freedom of speech, or those who don't worship just like Jesus does. Again, you're probably struggling to picture Jesus like this rallying, taking up the cry and running into the city and, and getting into the capital and causing a bunch of havoc. You probably can't picture Jesus doing that, can you? Yeah, neither can I. Why? You and I have probably read in the Bible in Romans 13, verses 1 and 2, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. Take that to heart. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Every time. Therefore, whoever resists the authority, resists the ordinance of God, the ordinary ways of God, and those who re resist will bring judgment upon themselves. Judgment on you is not the good life. I don't want that for you. So let's obey the scripture. But you're like, ah, but that's Paul. All right, look what Jesus says. Mark 12, 17, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and render to God the things that are God's. Whatever belongs to God, give to him. Whatever belongs to Caesar, give to Caesar. Whatever belongs to the government, I give him. Whatever belongs to God, make sure that you give that to God. Uh, am I oversimplifying the role of a Christian and an American citizen? Yes, of course I am. <laughs> but you can see some parallels and you're drawing some parallels right now, even as we talk. Hopefully, if we stop and consider the real Jesus long enough, and if you have the, the inclination, go look at that Down Here song called The Real Jesus. The band's called Down Here, and the song's called The Real Jesus. If we'll look at the real Jesus long enough, we will invite him to shape our lives and, you know, take up the job of Lord. <laughs> With Jesus as Lord, we know that he brings us into God's perfect plans for each of our lives, individually, and collectively. Specifically with this scripture, we can draw some practical application like, number one, pay your taxes. <laughs> Render to Caesar what's Caesar's. Number two, tithe and give offerings to God. Number three, if the government demands something at the end of a gun, as they do, that's their role, right? Peacekeepers, not peacemakers, is uh, if they demand something that is God's, Give God what's his still. Don't give it to the government. Give God what's his. Give the government what's theirs. The blessing of God is that when you do this, God gives you what you need. Say, for the tax bill, when you honor him with the tithe. Now, let me tell you what the government's never done. I never made sure that I paid my taxes and the government's like, you need to make sure you have enough for your tithe. Here's a little something. Make sure you get that tithe into the church real quick. They've never done that. And I'm sure you have the same exact testimony. I don't even know who all you are watching here. <laughs> but I'm telling you, God works differently. 
He says, you honor me first. You seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. I'll make sure you have enough for your tax bill. Why don't you go fishing? <laughs> Dig out some tax money from the mouth of that fish. That's what happened in the Bible. Crazy it sounds, but God does this kind of stuff. If we let him, we have to honor God first. Render unto Caesars what's Caesars and render unto God what's God's. Living for God is a different sort of lifestyle. Would you agree? Come on, wherever you are, agree with me. I'm going to embrace it by faith. Yes, living for God is a different sort of lifestyle, but it's the only way to a good life. So that's what we <laughs> promote around here. That's what we tout. That's, that's the thing I'm selling, right? And I hope you're buying. I want you to get the good life. I say it's time to be different, don't you? It's time to be different. Look, if you don't repent of sin and give your life to Jesus, you can't be saved. If you just believe that Jesus died for the sins of every human that will ever live, but you don't give him control of your life, you still won't inherit the kingdom of God. You won't get in to God's heaven. He, he's under no obligation to let you in. He made the way. You got to do the way. Repent of your sin. Make Jesus the Lord of your life. Amen. If you have not done that, I implore you today. I beg you with everything in me. There's nothing better that you can do besides making Jesus the Lord of your life. Do it today. Do it today. Do it before it's too late because we have this little piece of red tape on the rope of eternity and God wants you to make the most out of it. And so do I. There are many who call themselves Christians. You know this. And yet they don't live as true believers. Don't be deceived. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10 say, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? The unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. This is very plain talk. These guys aren't going to heaven and they can only go one other place. Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Now look at every one of these words. Look at every one of these categories of, of behaviors that people engage in outside of the will of God. None of those people are getting into God's heaven. He's not going to let anybody in who give their lives to that. He doesn't have to. He, he's made no promise that, oh yeah, but I'll, I'll make an exception for you. No. The exception is no matter what sin you've done, Jesus can cover it. Make Jesus Lord and get salvation. Come to heaven with me. <laughs> That's the exception. God sent the exception in, in the form of his son, allowed him to die a horrific death on the cross to make it possible for us. They won't inherit the kingdom of God. This anti-example I gave you last week uh, about uh, someone caught up in the spirit of adultery that I used to work with, ignoring the ways of God, forsaking his wedding, wedding vows to his godly wife and the mother of his children for an affair with another married woman. You remember this? I'm thankful, I am truly thankful that healing and restoration has seemed to come to that home, come to that marriage. They're together. Thank God you know stories like have not worked out like this in a similar situation, don't you? Someone has made the absolutely wrong choice, the, the fleeting pleasures of sin, and it cost them everything. Now, this, was, this did not cost nothing, but at least it didn't cost everything, and they have their family put back together. Hallelujah. It didn't utterly destroy the good life God intended for them, but it set it back. It did set it back some, and I'll tell you, it was uh, far from certain that it wouldn't end up in destruction, at least from my perspective at the time. And at least as far as their marriage, he took stock of his virtuous wife and God's instruction for the life and marriage of a believer and they're together today. Praise God. But we know it doesn't always work out this cleanly and uh, it could have ruined all of the rest of this life and all of the rest of the next for him if he didn't get out of that other adulterous affair. Didn't we just read in the Bible? Nor adulterers. Pick any one of them. 
And, and where do we fall into this thing? You know, I, I'm tempted to cheat on my taxes or I'm tempted to squeeze someone out of a little more than is right or whatever, right? Whatever our temptations are and we fall into these things, don't live there. Repent quickly. Ask God for forgiveness. Let him rescue you out of, you, out of that. Let him save you from that. Save you from yourself. Jesus doesn't save us so we can go on willfully, knowingly sinning and think we'll get away with it. He's always trying to save us from evil, to, to give us an abundant life here on the earth. And then when we die physically, to be united with him forever, perfectly as one in heaven. If you have anything like this going on in your life, it is time to come clean before the Lord. Tell him, I, I've been doing this. I see that it's wrong. I'm willing to give it all up in exchange for what you're offering me. Operate in humility because God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Amen. In John 8, 31 to 32, then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, if you stick with my word, if you live in my word, make it so precious to you, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. I keep telling you this, the truth shall make you free. Free. And that's got to get you excited. It gets me so excited that the truth that God has given us will make us free. When everybody in the world lives in complete bondage, we get to be free. Come on, saturate yourself in this truth. Commit yourself to God. Commit yourself to the truth and he will make you free. The truth, Jesus, the word from time immemorium will make you free. Jesus has always been the truth, will always be the truth, no matter what politics come and go. Amen. And now once you've sincerely made Jesus the Lord, not just the Savior, but the Lord of your life, you need to learn that you're now in a completely different category than everybody else. <laughs> they don't hold the candle to you. You're like, it's like horsepower, right? It's like, they're like one little horsepower, you know, just kind of barely getting by. And then Walt told me there's like some 1400 horsepower automobile. I was like, how, how does that even work? You know, it's like trying to hold a candle and be like, yeah, I got you lighthouse. <laughs> I got you helicopter searchlight with my one little candle. You know, no, you're in a completely different zone. God calls you perfect now. God calls you the right, his own righteousness in Christ. It's incredible. Some people, though, will think, well, I said that prayer at church that one time. Remember? Oh, you wouldn't remember. I mean, I said it under my breath and everything because I'm ashamed of Jesus. But this is what happens in most of the churches that I've been to and most of the churches that I know about. People are like, well, just slip up a hand like, just like this and put it right back down. I'll see you. I'll see you. Instead of, no, I'm making Jesus the Lord of my life. This is the coolest thing ever. This is the most incredible, miraculous moment of my life. I, everyone's got to know I'm a completely different person now. Everything has changed. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And so without just, oh, I just prayed that prayer and I'll get back to my life, just how I was living it. No, now you live for Jesus. Here at The Rock, we ensure that you know, as Paul Harvey would say, the rest of the story. <laughs> I don't know if he did that, but you know, old people, you know what I'm talking about. Here you get to find out what being a Christian actually is. Beyond what the Bible uh, describes as smooth, flattering words that, that some supposed Bible teachers would, would say and speak out to you because it sounds good. It does. I mean, just the blessing talk, it all sounds good to itching ears. Another Bible description of people who want to just hear the good stuff and not what it takes to have a real relationship. I don't know what the alternative to a real relationship is, but I don't want it. And... Uh, a relationship is costly. A relationship has requirements on it, doesn't it? Have you ever been in a relationship that doesn't have any requirements? <laughs> it's like, punch me in the face and I'll still be friends with you. Well, not too many times, you know. There has some requirements like don't punch me in the face. Don't steal from me. Don't abuse me. Don't ignore me, right? A relationship requires time, effort, commitment, intentionality, and it allows us to know one another, any relationship. But I'm talking about the relationship between us and God. Investing in God allows you to know that he knows you 
because he already knows that he knows you, but do you know that he really does know you? It allows you to know that he really does know all the most intimate parts of you. The parts that you're afraid to let out, the parts that you're ashamed of, the parts that you love. He knows all of it and he has good plans. He can make good, cause good to come out of anything. And so let him do it. But look, it also allows you to know him. See, God knows everything already. We don't know much. I don't know much, <laughs> but I know I love you. My wife doesn't like Aaron Neville, but I do. And that may be all I need to know. No. Anyway, I can't, do, <laughs> I can't do that tremolo thing like he does, but you get the picture. See, once you invest in this relationship, you get to avoid that harrowing scriptural certainty where Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, not everyone who says will enter the kingdom of heaven, but those who do the will of my Father in heaven. And then a, a verse or two later, it says, I will declare to those people, depart from me. I never knew you. I never knew you. You never gave me the chance to know you. I would have been in relationship with you had you only given me the time of day. But you didn't. You didn't. And now you, you got to go. It's too late. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And the law of the Lord is love. It's like it couldn't be any more straightforward. And really, it couldn't be any more beautiful. It's love. You know, the flag I was talking about earlier, the don't tread on me and all that kind of thing. You know the flag that Jesus waves? The flag of love. His banner over me is love. Isn't that incredible? His banner over me is love. He sings songs of love over me. He speaks love to me. God is love. Ephesians 5, 5 through 10 say, For this you know, that no fornicator, no unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater, we talked about idolatry in the lab, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you through empty words. Oh, blessing, blessing, blessing. God doesn't require anything of you. Just whisper this prayer. Mm -mm. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. That we're not talking cheap grace over here. It costs Jesus everything, and he's serious about it. Therefore, do not be partakers with them, verse 7. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Walk as children of light. Being saved is not about saying a prayer and having your title changed, you know, in your own mind. But now everything has actually changed. You become different and you start walking as children of light. And then in verse 10, it says, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. We need to find out what God wants us to do. But that can only happen once you've repented of your sins and truly committed yourself to following him as Lord. Just like we did again last weekend, going before the Lord for hours in these roles and goals sessions. The men met, the ladies met separately, all social distance and all the rest. And we just sought the Lord and just took some hours to do it because it takes some hours. How do you spell attention? T-I-M-E. Give attention to my word. Give attention to me, the Lord is saying. And what did he do? He showed up in a major way. And we got all these new goals that we have for all the roles that we play as the husbands and fathers and sons and brothers and workers and ministers and all the rest. We got to hear what God's good plans are for us. That's what I want for you. Who knows that we're living in precarious days? Take a little turn here. We are living in some precarious days and it would be easy to simply watch the news or follow social media to see what's going on, but you wouldn't get the real story. You wouldn't get the real story. You wouldn't get the whole story and you wouldn't get the real story. The real story is playing out in the spirit realm. And most people have no clue. Most people think that we have enemies on this earth that, you know, that, that our battle is with flesh and blood when the Bible says clearly it's not with flesh and blood. But our, we wrestle against rulers and powers and principalities in the air and all the rest. We have a spiritual battle to fight in prayer on our knees not storming the Capitol and, and with our 
guns and our agendas and our freedoms and, and our Viking horns. What was that? Whatever. Anyway, 2 Corinthians 4, 4. Let's just get back to the Bible because I, I can't even go there. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 in the New Living Translation says, Satan, who is the little g, God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. He's completely blinded them. Now they can't see any, any light, any truth. They're blind. They're unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ. It reminds me of another scripture about spiritual things being spiritually discerned so the world cannot receive them. The world doesn't get it because the world is not looking to spiritual things. Don't let that be you. I mean, you go here. Look, you're, you're getting the good stuff right here. You have the benefit of hearing these uncompromised teachings from the Word of God. I don't want to overstate that you already understand. And so I'm not going to say, oh, you, you all understand this. Maybe you don't, but maybe you're getting a glimpse. See, maybe because you're setting your mind on things above and not on earthly things, the provenient grace of God, the, the grace that draws you in and says, I'm going I'm to give you a glimpse. If you follow that light, you're going to find so much more of it. I'm going to say that you now have the opportunity to understand these things. So, since you've been here under the teaching, you should understand and you should be coming around to understanding because it's very simple. It, it almost takes you not wanting to understand to feign this ignorance, right? Having been in these services now because it's been so plain. Here it is in a nutshell. The human race was created by a loving and sinless God. Perfect. He gave humans a wonderful life. Literally, in the Garden of Eden. The description that we use for things that are perfect, right? It's like the Garden of Eden. He gave them the Garden of Eden. And number three, though there was one thing they were forbidden to do, after only a few deceptive words, this is all it took for Satan to get their attention and get them off track and ruin all of this until like the last two chapters of the Bible. They sinned against God. Look, I'll eat whatever I want around this garden. Yeah, L looks good to me. Looks like it'd be some good eating. And not only that, but I'll get to be like God too. Let's eat this thing. Adam, you with me? I'm with you, baby. And they ate the apple. No, ha <laughs> ha, it didn't take long. And it, and it only took Satan a couple deceptive words to get him to fall into that trap. We're suckers, I'm telling you. That sin contaminated their soul and spirit and separated them from God. They had no power to resolve their incompatibility with their holy creator, and they were still subject to death. The punishment God warned them would ensue if they sinned. And boy, God keeps his promises. God swears to keep his promises. Seeing them completely helpless, God loved them and wanted to save them. The Son of God expressed his willingness to become a human being, one of the created, having been the creator, and then to take the punishment for each and every human who would ever live. And with an abundance of love, the Father expressed his willingness to give his only Son as a sacrifice for them. This doesn't sound like steal, kill, destroy. This sounds like life and life more abundantly. Anything that we got to do to win these people back so they can be with us, that's what we're going to do. Father and Son, Holy Spirit, united. They're going to get this plan going. So what happens? Jesus becomes a man born through a virgin so that the sin of mankind would not translate to him. And he remained completely obedient to every one of the commandments required by God that he would not be guilty of his own sin and therefore be qualified to take the punishment of all sin off every other human being. So that if they were willing to exchange their life for his, as I'm inviting you to do today, God would consider that Jesus died in our place. So now they'll live in his place as an obedient child of God on the earth. Now, are you a person who embraces this, who understands this, who's willing to understand it? God gave Jesus for you to pay the price you couldn't pay so that you can now live the life of Jesus, obedient to God and get all the good life he has for you. Are you a person that understands this, the good news? and accepts Jesus' sacrifice for your sins by committing to live as God's child in obedience to him? Or are you a person who will not understand? Just reject it. I'm, 
Thanks, preacher. Bye. You'll unnecessarily spend eternity paying for your sins and the rejection of the good news, the rejection of Jesus. I, none of us want that for you. If you're committed to exchange your sinful life for Jesus' righteous life, then you must understand that your new life must be different because it is different. Incidentally, we spend some time right here in Operation Solid Lives Level 1, which if you're catching Service Live, of course, again, today, Level 1 starts. So sign up on your service card at the end of service to meet us in class. But we talk about the great exchange. If you decide to relinquish control of your life to Jesus, accepting the great exchange, 1 John 5, 19 comes into play. Now, we know that we are all children of God and that the world around us is under control of the evil one. Look, it is true. The world is under control of the, of the evil one, but we are children of God when we relinquish that control to him. And in John 15, 18 through 19, Jesus said, if the world hates you, keep in mind it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you. You don't belong to the world. I've chosen you out of the world. You were in the world. I chose you out of it. Not only did I choose you from among it, but I pulled you out of it too. Jesus is amazing. That is why the world hates you. So don't be surprised when the world hates us for the things that we believe, the things that we report that God says. Of course, they're going to hate us for it. They're blinded. The world's under the, the sway of the wicked one. If unbelievers affirm everything that you say, the way that you process things, you should be very concerned because they're under the influence of Satan. And he thinks a certain way. He's anti-God. He's against God. He wants no part of God. The world will, well, except God's power, the world will often recoil at the things that you say. The truth you offer, the blessings you let come out of your mouth, they'll recoil at it. The world will try to censor you, make no mistake. And Jen and I were just talking about it. It seems like it's accelerating rapidly, this censorship of things that, of the Lord. They're going to try to get you to not speak. Unless, of course, you're saying exactly what they want you to say and affirm what they want you to affirm. You see the sinister nature of the world? The sinister nature of the world is that they call love talk hate speech. God is love. God's words, loving. Whom God loves, he corrects. Hmm, okay, he shows you a better way. Don't do that. Do this. That's love. They call it hate speech. Sinister. And this is what we're walking into. And it seems like it's uh, like the avalanche. It's just rolling faster and faster. And it is going to bowl us over. You know me, though. I must warn you that if you're going to speak God's truth, you got to do it in love. Speaking the truth in love. And don't just say, yeah, I'm speaking the truth and so it's loving. No, speak the truth in love. In love. You'll draw more flies with honey than with vinegar. Right? Jesus wasn't like, don't sin anymore. <laughs> I was going to say a word, but then I remember I have all kinds of kids watching. But lady caught in adultery, you know, he, he wasn't going to go there. He wasn't rude. He wasn't mean to her. He was very gentle with her. He said, where are your, those who would condemn you? They're not here. And neither do I condemn you. And then he told her the truth from all this love. He said, go and sin no more. It wasn't like sin was going to be okay. Jesus didn't let the sin continue unaddressed. He said, I don't condemn you either. Go sin no more. Live right. In 1 John 2, 15 through 17, in God's word, it says, don't love the world and what it offers. Those who love the world don't have the Father's love in them. Not everything that the world offers, physical gratification, greed, extravagant lifestyles, comes from the Father. It comes from the world. And the world and its evil desires are passing away. But the person who does what God wants lives forever. God in the Bible clearly differentiates his people from the rest of the world. We're different. It's time to be different. Now let's get back to what Jesus said in John 10, 10. Thief not coming except to steal, kill, and destroy, but he comes that they may have life and have it more abundantly. He came that you may have eternal life. 
That's the most important. But he also paid for us to live as children of God here on the earth. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Jesus is making us some promises here. God didn't make the world these promises. He made you and me these promises to his kids, his family, to believers, so that the blessings that he gives according to his word would stand out in stark contrast to the lives of regular people, what the Bible describes as mere mortals in the world. See, there's supposed to be an obvious difference in how you process, how you feel, how you think, how you speak, how you act, how you work, how you love, how you live. All different from the world. All God's ways. It's time to be different. Let's pray. And, and not just as a matter of course. And let me invite you to do this. Don't mutter this under your breath. Take this seriously. We're going to pray some things out all together. And why don't we just do this for the sake of ease. Let's just say all these words. All right. We know that we don't have to get saved over and over again. But if this is your first time, let's just all say this together. And then we're also going to move into some other things. Committing to the Lord today, unashamedly, boldly, that we're giving our lives to Jesus. Father, come on, say it. Father, thank you for the truth. Thank you for sending someone to tell me the truth. I receive your word today. I've heard you and I know you're telling me the truth. Set me free. I choose Jesus as my Lord. I want to give him control of my life. And I give him control right now. Thankfully. Work in me to live for you. Just like you raised Jesus from the dead. You're raising me from death to life. I choose to live that new life for you. Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Let me see my life through your lens. Let me not go my own way, but turn my attention to you and to your good plans for me. That's what I want. I want to live the good life, not the life that I was creating. I want to seek you and find you. Thank you for finding me today. I devote my life to learning about Jesus. Believing everything he says and telling as many people as I can the good news. Rescuing those I love from darkness and getting them saved from destruction by giving them the gift of your son. In whose name we pray. Amen. Amen.